<laughs> Thank you. That was beautiful. Right. That was easy. And I have asked Darren to share for 15 or whatever minutes <laughs> their experience trying to help us. <laughs> Thank you, man. I'm Darren. I'm a heroin addict. Hey, Darren. Yeah, Darren. I'm hold this thing hostage. <laughs> Uh, like I said, I'm a heroin addict. Um, so I have a sobriety date. It's September 20th, 2008. Um, I have a sponsor that I actively work with, um, and I've been through the 12 steps through, uh, as outlined in the big book, um, with a step study sponsor. So I've done an inventory, the fifth step, and um, six and seven, actively pursuing amends and practice 10, 11, and 12 every day. And um, <clears throat> that has plugged me into a uh, higher power that has seemed to, um, that has um, fixed this thing. Um, so I originally grew up in Southern Illinois. I'm not from around here. Um, I'm the youngest uh, of three. And I have, uh, I've never seen alcohol, drugs, anything like that in my household. Um, nothing of that sort. Um, you know, this whole thing, like my condition, this problem that I have, had nothing to do with the way that I was brought up whatsoever. Um, by all means, my childhood was normal. Um, there was nothing that ever happened to me um, that I can pinpoint that was a major issue. Um, but I always like to talk about this and mention this point that I always had this thing going on. I can, I could pinpoint it from the time that I was about 11 years old. Um, and typically when people like, like answer this, when you see a shooting star, what do you do? Make a wish. You make a wish. <laughs> so the wish that I would always wish would be, um, that I could wake up and be somebody else. Um, and if I could be somebody else, if I could have what they had, the material possessions, the family, the things, then I was convinced that I would be okay. And those were the wishes that I would wish upon shooting stars. And I didn't understand at that time that there was like, that that was like an issue, you know, that was an issue. Like I bought in to the, one of the biggest lies, if not the biggest lie that I ever truly bought into. That's if I change my outsides, I can fix my insides. And it absolutely didn't work. Throughout my experience, as I, you know, explain it in different ways, there was many manifestations of me trying to do that. Change my outsides to fix my insides. And it never truly worked. I grew up in a, a small town, farm town in southern Illinois um, with the Snowbird family. So I had grandparents that went back and forth to Arizona since I was like six. My parents later on in life did that too. Um, but I had my, you know, introduction, um, you know, to alcohol and drugs was we had an open campus at school. And so you could like, you could leave to go to lunch. You could like drive. But, like the day I turned 16, I got my license, had a truck. Um, and you could leave for like 45 minutes or something like that. Go to Dairy Queen or whatever place, DiMaggio's Pizza and come back. And I remember seeing like some of my friends come back and they were like acting all goofy and giggling and whatnot. And I had straight FOMO. It was just fear of missing out. And I was wondering what was it that they were doing? And what they were doing was smoking weed. So I was like, okay, I want to do that. And, you know, I started pursuing that. And, you know, as a young kid, you know, from 15 into 16, like I can't get it all the time. You know, I, so it was like, but I was definitely convinced that I was going to do this as many times as whatever opportunity that I had to do this, period. Um, and I started, you know, dabbling with that, dabbling with alcohol. Um, and, you know, m a little later, introduced to methamphetamine. And I didn't really see it as like a super hard drug at the time, but <laughs> it definitely is. Even in Arizona, it's classified in its own level beyond, like, all other narcotics. <laughs> if you go to prison for that, it's, like, much more than anything else. And, um, you know, it's just every it's occasional. 
Uh, I grew up in sports. Um, I was a competitive swimmer ever since I was eight. And, you know, that was something that I always did. Um, I ended up moving high schools um, from Southern Illinois to where I swam club to Mount Vernon, Indiana, and ended up, you know, going from there and making that change. It was only like, if you think about it, from like here to Albany, but it was across the border there, um, different state. Um, and I had, you know, really great parents that my mom came over and lived with me there. And my dad still lived at home in Illinois. Um, you know, that was a big sacrifice that they made. I, you know, didn't consider it at the time, but it was like, picture doing that. Like if you're married to somebody and you like, you're living 30 minutes apart just for the opportunity for, you know, a child to, you know, pursue this. Um, you know, I have an older brother, 17 months older than me, uh, always was tugging on his shirt tail, trying to do what he was doing, uh, wear the clothes he was cl wearing, uh, literally just mimic him over and over and over. And that was one of the reasons why I did it. He moved high schools. Uh, he was, he ended up swimming in college uh, and I was doing the same thing. I had no idea what to do in my life, period. So I was just like, well, let's try what he's doing. And I made a big sacrifice in that. And then the sacrifice was actually finding out who I truly was. Um, so I ended up moving over there. And, um, you know, it talks about in the big book, like, we, like, build this structure up and just rip it down, like, at the, ex like, getting tied at exactly the wrong moments. And, you know, dabbling around my junior year, I, I went out on methamphetamine the night before sectionals. Um, I was doing things like that, definitely like, like training an entire year to do this thing for this meet because sectionals was a huge thing. That's where the scouts were. And just going out and staying out all night on methamphetamine and showing up early the next morning, still high, trying to swim, you know, and it's, that's not good for the heart rate at all. Um, so I would do things like that. And then I remember my senior year, I was captain of the swim team. And, you know, train the entire year um, up until the point of about sectionals. I got caught with a can of chew on school property um, and got suspended and could not swim in that meet. Um, and that was devastating to family. It was absolutely devastating uh, because, you know, it was really pursuing up until this meet for two years um, to be able to pursue, you know, collegiate swimming. That's where the scouts were. And it was the perfect cocktail, so to speak, opportunity for me to say, F it. You know, after that, I gave up swimming. After that, I pursued drugs even harder and just had this no care attitude. Um, shortly after high school, completed high school, didn't do too well, but ended up completing high school and going to college. And like right into college, got a DWI and a kid broke his leg in two places. Um, felt terrible about that situation. Um, but that was my first stint, you know, with getting arrested and having any issue, you know, publicly like that. And it kind of shell shocked me, you know, the first time getting arrested. And my father's a Marine. And, you know, if you say you're going to do something, you absolutely do it. Um, it's the way I was brought up. And he approached me about, uh, you know, he received some direction in his life through the Marine Corps, um, would I take that opportunity to do that, um, to be able to get some direction in my life? So I shook his hand that I would do that, and I had no intention whatsoever. It was literally just get off my back for this moment, one of those things. So I sabotaged that and ended up like starting this cycle of like when I would move away from home. Um, you know, at the time that that happened, it was like, you know, the frat boy house. I had, like, all my friends in an apartment, and all there was was drinking and drugs all the time. And that blew up in my face, crashed a car, kid got hurt, I got a DWI. So it was like, moved back home, and then I would, like, family would help me with opportunities, and I would, like, have these opportunities. I would move away, and then I would just blow my life up through some crazy situation and all to move back home and then to nurse me back to health, detox me, whatever it might be. Um, ended up moving back to Illinois and back home with them. Um, 
then down to Florida for a little bit to pursue school um, for recording arts, which was a dream of a friend of mine's. I had no intention of actually doing that. Um, it was another one of those things. Within 13 months, blew up my life down there. Uh, ended up moving back home in Illinois, um, and it was a, it was a lot of that. Um, stayed in Illinois for probably a couple years. Um, that brother that was swimming uh, in college, um, he approached me. Um, he graduated college, and he said, "Hey, you know, Dad had pursued, you know, the military. He goes, I'll help you. Um, he's one of the most stand-up guys that I know, honestly." Um, to this day, we're really good friends. Um, and so he sat me down and I agreed to do that. Um, he ended up getting in shortly after. I mean, he graduated college. So, you know, the military loves people that graduate college and then join the military. Um, I ended up, you know, getting much harder into drugs, into opiates, things like that. Um, and postponed all of that, like, drug my feet with the military stuff as long as I could. Um, ended up going to a 30 day treatment place out in Arizona um, where I was high within three days of getting out of there. And, you know, my, my dad was baffled, everybody was baffled. Um, and I ended up, you know, making this geographical cure, so to speak, where I would move out to Arizona uh, to be able to get away from all the people um, and, you know, that was going to fix Darren's problem was it was the people he was around. That's not true whatsoever, but everybody wanted to believe it. I wanted to believe it. So I ended up moving out there. Um, and then after being out there for a period of time, like I said, my brother went into the military. Um, I was supposed to follow suit um, with that. It was, you know, a long time of pursuing that. And, you know, I ended up taking the ASVAB test, did pretty well on that. I was sworn in, um, which was like sort of a shell shock little, like, like it was pretty intense for me to actually like walk through that. It was like, this is a reality that I'm going to join the military. <laughs> and, you know, going from just doing what I want all the time. Um, and I ended up like, like I was going to have this, I wanted to have this like big hoorah situation, you know, like go back to Illinois, get with all the boys before I go to boot camp. And it was like roughly 30 days. It was like Thanksgiving 2007. Uh, and I ended up going back to Illinois. Meanwhile, like I had been introduced to heroin at that time. I was introduced January 1st, 2007. I'll remember it because I was uh, at Glendale Stadium I took this guy, we used to always, my family used to always go to, uh, my dad got tickets, who's a pretty successful guy, um, always get tickets given to him to go to the Fiesta Bowl. And that's, you know, a big game for college football. And it was the Boise State, Oklahoma game um, where the, they won by the Statue of Liberty play. And <clears throat> I took this guy um, that I went to treatment with. And, uh, you know, after that, he introduced me to heroin and that's when I snorted heroin and you know the the eventful time of that night was you know me sticking my head out the window not trying not to pass out while driving uh, getting back home and I'll tell you I had such a great time it took me like an hour and a half to like te type this text message like good night it was just I had the time of my life I fell in love with it um, you know it was just nodding off and nodding off and then I would type a letter and then nod off type a letter and you know I knew this was going to be the thing that I would pursue so he introduced me I didn't have my own hookup so it was like I was going through him all the time and this is all while pursuing and getting sworn into the military <laughs> I don't know how I pulled off like being able to pee clean but it was a legitimate I peed clean you know I don't know how I was able to get you know, three, four, five, six days clean off of it, but I did. Uh, and then I was going to have this big hoorah situation back in Illinois before I go. And, you know, within 24 hours, uh, I was on like a huge cocktail of a bunch of stuff. I don't remember like what actually happened. I remember being at a table, um, mixing benzos and opiates and just this long stupor blackout thing. Evidently, like I was around my grandmother and there were just pills all over the table. 
she calls my father up from Arizona and he's like, you're getting on the next flight back. I was supposed to be there a week. Within 24 hours, he was like calling me back to, to Arizona like you're getting home immediately. And I remember going to get gas. I got gas in the rental car and I was heading back to, you know, in Southern Illinois, we fly out from Lambert Airport in St. Louis. So it was a two hour drive and I took off. And evidently, I flipped the car three times, hit two trees in a ditch, and broke my neck and split my head open. And I woke up in the hospital uh, to my grandma saying that you broke your neck. Um, and I didn't, I, I just didn't even know what happened. And, you know, at that point in time, I remember a lady coming in and, like, giving me, like, a, I was three days in ICU and three days in a regular bed, um, giving me, like, a sponge bath, like, cleaning off my legs and she was like you need your medication and I just had this moment where I was like don't give me that I literally like pushed her away and said don't give me that I can't have it um I had this understand like just this weird understanding in that moment that that type of stuff was like not good for me <laughs> you know like I couldn't I couldn't handle it and you know I was in a uh, regular hospital bed and then my dad, you know, flew back all the way to Illinois. Uh, this was in Evansville, Indiana, that I was in Deaconess Hospital. They wanted to put me in a halo, and he kept them from putting me in a halo, so I was in a neck brace for three months. And, you know, like, like getting out of that, like, we went back to Illinois, and, like, he was going to keep my medication. It came to this point where, like, I, I was so much an issue, like, with family members that he was like, I'm going to hang on to your pills and I'll give them to you. And I had a broken neck. I would say I medically and legitimately needed some of the medication, but my thinking was, once it's in my system, like, when he went to sleep, I went in the room. I snuck into that room quietly and took half the bottle, knowing damn well that he was going to count them. And he woke up and he just, like, he literally shook me in the chair and was like, what are you doing? Much more elevated of a voice. Um, just baffling. And that's like over and over what I would do to people is like present a certain way and just fucking baffle them with all this type of behavior. Um, stole his car that night, went across town, all just sneaking around without waking them up. And I, sh I shouldn't have been doing any of that. I couldn't even turn my neck. I couldn't do anything. I still had staples in my head. I still had blood that was just crusted all through. And here I was showing up at people's house, and they're like, dude, go home. <laughs> and that's all I could think to do. And, you know, I ended up moving. Like, I was still living with family. Like, it was like I couldn't shower. I couldn't do anything. It was, like, super lazy. Uh, just lay around and I ended up you know taking Tylenol the rest of the time because he was like I'm not gonna give you that anymore and I, I made it through I mean it, it was fine you know it sucked when I sneezed but <laughs> it was fine <laughs> but here here it was again you know I was living at home and I turned into an absolute terrorist um, I would say that you know I need to go take a walk and I would just go out to the garage. I would open the garage door and I would just take off in their car, come back four hours later and be like, no, I'm not under the influence. What are you thinking? And make it out like they're fucking wrong and they're bad people for thinking of me that way. When really what I was doing was just, just absurd. I got cleared medically and they were still gonna take me into the military. So here I am pursuing that again and this is all while still using heroin and not even at the point of <laughs> IV use yet. <laughs> still just snorting it, stealing from them, taking everything that was not bolted down. And <clears throat> I got busted in this reverse sting operation. Um, and here I was again in jail, called family. And my dad, <clears throat> you know, shows up at like four o'clock in the morning to pick me up. And, you know, I give them this huge lie of, you know, I was just paying back dealers and I was in the wrong place at the wrong time. And that's the reason why I got arrested. And, you know, whether he believed it or not, you know, he was pursuing it. My sister was super angry at me, couldn't even be around me. Um, 
and got red flagged and couldn't join the military. So to like explain the situation, here was my brother who joined the military who didn't need to whatsoever to do it to help me, who's in the South Pacific. And here's Darren doing the same type of stuff. And, you know, that started this whole stint of, you know, if you can't go in the military, you're going to pursue work. So what does Darren do? <laughs> Darren presents as though for a very long time that he's going out and actively pursuing jobs. I would, this, this is the types, types of situations that I, I would sort of create. I would have this cell phone, and this was day in and day out. I would wake up, and if I did not have anything, this is whether or not I had something on me was how hard I was pursuing this, but I would turn my ringer on because, and then I would have a fake conversation with somebody on the phone that was calling me about a job opportunity um, uh, because I knew my dad would come down the hallway out of his office and say, do you need the car? Do you need money? Because he wanted me to get a job. And I would create this situation. I would go out, I would shoot dope, smoke crack all day long, come back and tell them stories uh, with specific names, locations that I went to, um, who I talked to, and create this such situation like they wanted to uh, meet me again the next morning, you know, to carry it into the next day all just to be able to get more drugs. And I did that for probably three months, and I think there was only one location that I went to, period. And it was just absolutely insane. Um, they got very tired of me. You know, I wore out my welcome with family. Um, they started locking the doors. I, you know, said that I was going to go to this halfway house. Um, I remember getting caught by them, you know, in, in different ways. Eventually, I always got caught. I was never, like, too good at, you know, hiding syringes and, you know, spoons and all of that stuff and track marks, and I just didn't care. And, you know, I, I got... <clears throat> I talked to this um, crossroads in Phoenix, and it was this place that, like, had a ton of beds, but you, like, worked and pursued, you know you were sober and you worked and whatnot. And so I talked to these people and did this little phone screen thing. And I, you know, told them that <clears throat> I just used alcohol, uh, period. So I could continue to use drugs. And I ended, up, <laughs> I ended up getting asked to leave there. They would take you back if you could pee clean. Um, but I got asked to leave there when they noticed the huge line of, <laughs> of track marks up my arm. And I ended up, you know, going to the street for a few days and then coming back with clean pee and getting back in and then the same thing happened again and this was I didn't know where else to go um, so I went to the street in Phoenix and I was that guy with the sign you know off the exit of woe is me you know <laughs> this is a situation and you know please help me and I did that uh, panhandled uh, sleeping behind circle K's and whatnot for you know a shorter period of time and I got very tired of that. I got real tired of that very quick. And it was summertime in Phoenix, super hot <laughs> all the time, even at night. It's above 100 degrees. Um, and I ended up, you know, reaching out to my brother. I just had this moment where I was really tired and I didn't want to do this anymore. And I knew there was, there's got to be something better. So I called him and he was stationed in Alaska and he was driving back to Illinois so he was coming through Canada. And I don't remember what I said to him. I know I got pretty honest with him and you know, he said, let me call mom and dad. Uh, communicated through email with my mom and she said, hey, there's this location. Evidently she talked to me about it a year and a half before. I don't remember that whatsoever. Um, but they said, there's this place you can get to. Um, are you willing to accept help? And I said yes, and I got out to this place. I went out to Wickenburg, Arizona. I'd never been to Wickenburg, Arizona. It was like 60 miles outside of Phoenix, and, you know, they took me there. And the next morning, I ended up going to detox. I was supposed to be there for five days. And, you know, once I started to feel better, you know, on a you know, cocktail of medication, you know, detoxing, I, was, I just, you know, I wanted to pursue this thing. And so I told them at day four, 
Please take me off all the medication. I want to get to this location and do this thing. Uh, so they did. And I remember getting hot flashes for like, I don't know, three weeks. When I would smoke cigarettes, I would like get hot flashes and cold chills and whatnot. That was like the extent of, you know, my withdrawal or whatever. But I ended up getting to this, uh, going out to this ranch in the middle of the desert. I was like 10 miles in the middle of the desert. And all these, you know, younger guys, semi-younger guys, uh, shirt tucked in, shaven face, um, you know, hair buzzed, that whole thing. Um, but people were, I mean, I came out of detox and was bucking bales of hay. Like, that's what I was doing on a farm. And it was cool to me. It was like, I was super gung-ho about being sober. I had no idea how to be sober, but I was super gung-ho about being sober. And <clears throat> I was ready to do this thing. Like I said, 18 days into that, um, there was this thought that came. I heard somebody had, you know, left, you know, the ranch. No, like, nobody's going to fucking walk. It's 10 miles literally in the middle of the desert. Um, everything's going to poke or prod you, you know, cactus everywhere, so on and so forth. Um, but I had this thought that um, maybe I could go out and use one more time. My idea was I was going to bring drugs back in and I would bury it and just use it occasionally. Like, that was my thought. Sort of social drug use in a treatment facility. That was my thinking. And so I ended up waking up at like 3 o'clock in the morning, and I walked 10 miles in the middle of the desert, hitchhiked back to Phoenix, panhandled, like, didn't panhandle, but I pawned this chain that this kid sent, and you got a considerable amount of money for it. I stayed out for five days and then came back with, you know, a smaller amount of dope and, you know, hit it. You know, I came back and I had uh, syringes and dope and everything else, like, scotch taped to my leg. Um, I got back to that place and was still using in there, and they sort of caught on to it because when you're the only fucked up person in a sober community, it's pretty obvious, you know, when you're nodding out at inconvenient times. Um, so they caught on to it. I was kind of scared a little bit, so I didn't use that evening, and, but there was two other guys that I was using with. And that night that I did not, uh, I woke up to the police there and a kid OD'd, and the other one uh, was there, but he found him, um, and I was arrested and take, taken to uh, Prescott uh, and put in jail. And I had no idea, like, I've sort of explained, like, blowing up my life, I was ready to, like, move on already from this place. I was already, like, ready to continue another lie someplace else. And I remember being, um, I was taken to two different locations. I was in Camp Verde, too. I've never been to Camp Verde since. Probably will never go. Um, but I remember being shackled in oranges, and I was reading the report that they gave to me, and the kid was alive, which I was really happy about. Uh, and I looked to my right, and the guy who did my intake was there giving me the opportunity to come back. I didn't really know how to take that. Um, I didn't know that it was going to pay dividends, like, much later on down the line. Like, I was used to, um, you know, messing things up and then moving on, you know. Just cutting those people off, saying, see you later. Um, these people wanted to bring me back. And they said, we understand your type. Um, we would like to work with you. Like, there's hope. Um, so I ended up going back to that place. It was a year-long place. I ended up, you know, like, meeting some really influential people really understanding and starting to understand like what this whole thing was. Um, and I ended up, you know, I was in like, it was broken up into three different, it was very long term, three different sort of like phases of this whole thing. Um, but I ended up, you know, with that situation, it was a perfect opportunity where like honesty was easy after that. You know, it was all out there. The whole situation was out there, so it was an opportunity for me to just ride that and continue to be honest. So that's what I started doing, and I met this guy like probably four months in. Um, I 
just came back from Arizona and I just saw him. Uh, his name's Destry and he used to be the Marlboro man uh, and do some, some work in some capacity for Marlboro. And he was the first person that I ever identified with. This guy, he was a cowboy. He was like, I would say like pushing 50 at the time and I was just turning 24. Like everything was different physically about us. Um, you know, I was a spoiled kid. He was this cowboy. But when he talked about his drinking and drug use, he pinned me up against a wall. Like, what he was saying, the things that he was saying, I never thought anybody ever experienced before. And I truly identified with that man. And that was a huge experience for me, um, you know, in the beginning to be able to understand that there's other people out there. At the same time, he was walking me through the doctor's opinion out of the big book and asking me questions like, have you ever been through this? This is what this means. Have you ever done this? This is what I did. Have you ever done this? And it was like, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So after that, you know, I had my introduction to 12 step meetings. Um, I had never really pursued them before and I had an opportunity to come up here and do a transitional program uh, for six months after. So like I was in treatment a long time. Um, so I came up here and did that program, fell in love with New York. Um, I was back in, you know, Tucson with family for a little bit because my grandma was going to pass away. Everybody knew it. So I wanted to be close to family in Northern Idaho for, you know, a period of three months or so. But then I came back out here and I've been here ever since. And, um, you know, I had my introduction, like I said, to 12 step meetings and I was going to meetings all the time. I had two separate commitments. I used to go to like 10 to 13 meetings a week. I got really connected. Um, this, I knew like you get a sponsor, you get a commitment, you get connected. Um, and I did those things and then it started to wear off. You know, like I, I, at first, like the language of the heart and having other people that have been through the same types of situations, like that was huge for me. Like I used to get the chills all the time. And it was like, I loved that. You used to leave meetings feeling phenomenal, phenomenal, just from listening, period. And then it like, I remember sitting in my home group in Fortsville and I was just like looking around the circle of people. And I was like, what the fuck's this doing for me? You know, like what, what is this, what is this really doing for me? Um, I didn't know that there was like a whole thing that like this entire fellowship, Alcoholics Anonymous, was doing that I wasn't doing. Like there was a whole piece that I was missing. Um, and you know, shortly after I told you that I, you know, spent time in Tucson, I went back there and I met this group of people. I was at this meeting. I smoked at the time, and I like said this prayer when I got there, like. God, show me what meeting to go to when I moved to a first, you know, a location that I hadn't been to before. And this guy comes in and he says, hey, I know you're new here. Uh, there's this smoking meeting. And I smoked at the time. I was like, fuck yeah, I'm going to go to this smoking meeting. <laughs> like, like, that's sweet. He's like, you can meet my sponsor if you want. Uh, you can check out this meeting. So I, I went and, like, it was a pretty dope meeting. Uh, I remember smoking like three cigarettes, like I didn't share shit. I just sat there and smoked cigarettes and we walked outside and I was talking to some of these people and I heard this guy talk about Southern Illinois University and like, that's like 40 minutes from my hometown and I was in Tucson at the time. So I'm like, I'm going to go talk to that guy. So I talked to that guy. They took me to Denny's, uh, where I was there for about four hours, I would say. And I walked in, into this situation with uh, a bunch of big book thumpers. Everybody had their big book. I did not. Uh, and they proceeded to ask me about 80 questions, roughly, throughout that period of time of what I thought to be true about Alcoholics Anonymous, 12 steps, so on and so forth. And I answered honestly what I thought was the truth for me. And I left there with my entire perception of this whole thing uh, just broken. Um, and I, 
understood. I ended up working with Tom for a while after that. Uh, but I understood that, you know, the 12 steps fully completed as laid out in the big book was what I didn't complete. Uh, I moved back out here, like, I, but I had an understanding of there were things that I hadn't done yet and I understand what to do. So it was like the next object was to uh, find a person mo most knowledgeable about that and do it. And that's when I started working with this guy from New York City. And it was such a beautiful thing. Like, like since I've been here, like in the rooms, like whatever I've needed, it has absolutely been provided. And, you know, in turn, after doing all of this work, like having an understanding that like this, like I have like a spiritual problem. That whole thing manifests in my mind into this thing that like convinces me to do this thing that I know is not a good idea. <clears throat> but um, that's what this whole thing like fixes, you know, being useful to other people. Um, but I came out here, ended up completing all 12 steps. And um, like I understood like that that whole problem like that I talked about like in the beginning of my story, that whole thing of like wishing upon shooting stars to wake up and be somebody else. Like this whole thing that we do within the 12 steps fixes that. And that was something that was absolutely huge for me. Um, and like being comfortable in my own skin. Um, you know, after doing inventory and a fist step and pursuing amends, like I had the opportunity to make amends to my brother. I was really uncomfortable for a long time, like being when he was on leave and I would be, you know, just out of treatment again. Um, I felt really bad about that, that, you know, he, you know, wanted to help me and join the military to help me pursue my life. And I wasn't able to follow through on that. And I mean, he said the, at the time, all I could do is weep and cry, but I don't know where he like learned the language, but um, in the amends process to him, um, you know, he said like, I don't have, like he was doing triathlons and you know, he works at West Point now, which is awesome um, with survival swimming, but he was a very active guy doing triathlons, a lot of outdoor stuff. And, and he said that a lot of people don't like to do what he does. A lot of people don't have the common interests that he does. Um, and he explained, like, you within the fellowship have all of these people trying to help one another in this common issue. And then he said, I want what you have. And like I said, this is a guy that I tried to, like, mimic my entire life. Um, in turn, you know, wanting something that this fellowship freely provides. And that was a huge, huge thing for me to to propel me in the right area of uh, this is exactly what I'm supposed to be doing. This gives me a format for life, period, uh, that I absolutely need. Um, but yeah, it's been beautiful in just showing up day in and day out um, and trying to be as unselfish as I possibly can. So thanks for letting me share. Thanks, Aaron. This is a discussion meeting. Please limit your sharing to your experience, strength, or experience only with the topic of discussion.